I want to say something about uh, spacecraft here because I, I think it is just fantastic. You know, this thing, what happens, Cassini was the name named after the head of the, <coughs> named after Roma's boss. <coughs> it was put up in 1997 and expected to last four years. It lasted 20 years. What I want to emphasize here is just the amazing thing that the transmitter in this thing is 50 watts. That 50 watts pointed towards Earth can send ones and zeros, like Morse codes, dots and dashes, back to an object a bit like a television antenna on the roof of a house at the Goldstone facility in the outer suburbs of Los Angeles, which are 700 million miles away, and the radio waves take an hour to get there. So we have to believe that these field lines that Faraday had seen between his magnet poles can stretch out, can reach out across the complete vacuum of outer space and cause electrons in a wire, very slippery electrons, to slosh up and down on the antenna at Goldstone near Los Angeles and make a signal. Now it works for, it's got several things going for it. First, this is directional, so it's a, it's a dish. But it's not a very good dish, very good, very, very directional. The beam that it sends out has a width of five million miles when it gets to Earth, much wider than the Earth, because you can't have a very big dish, it's too heavy. The one at Goldstone is 70 meters, I think it's a bit better. Secondly, they're transmitting and receiving on the same frequency, of course that helps a lot. But most important, they cool the receiver at Goldstone down to about zero temperature. And what that does is to quieten all the hiss and static that you normally hear when you tune a radio between stations. Okay, so the net effect of all this in 1900 was that things were in a complete mess. There are lots of papers with a million crazy theories. Some of the craziest were that um, <coughs> moving clocks slow down because if they're going very fast, and that moving objects get shorter in the direction of their length if they move very fast. But no one had a coherent unified exploration for all of this information. Here's a summary of what we've said so far. Maxwell's equations suggested an absolute reference frame. Maxwell's equations gave a speed of light. It didn't depend on the speed of the source. If you have a car coming towards you at night, shining its headlights at you, you would expect that if the car sped up, the light would speed up. It doesn't. No matter how fast the car is going, the light coming at you always comes at you at the same speed. There's no headwind, as we were saying. Unlike waves on a river, light speed did not seem to add to the ether current speed. Michelson's result was that there was no stationary ether fixed to the remote stars. That didn't help. Bradley's result was the opposite. Here's the point. If if the ether was fixed to the... Oh, I mean, one explanation for Michelson's result, which he didn't really want to put in his paper, was that the ether is bolted onto the earth. I mean, the church would have loved that. And that as the earth rotated, it dragged this ether stuff throughout the entire universe around with it. Um, and if that were the case, that could not be true, because if the ether was dragged around with the earth, um, you wouldn't need to tilt your experiment, your telescope in Bradley's experiment because the light waves would be bolted onto the ether. So the, the, Bradley's result was contradictory to Michelson's. There was good agreement with the Fresnel theory. Fizeau had done experiments running light through running water, water running anti-parallel to the light and, and measuring the speed of light as he sped up the water and he got a change and it fit with um, Fresnel's theory. So people tended to think Fresnel's old theory of 1820 was probably right. And then the biggest problem of all was that Newton's laws uh, couldn't accept this idea about the speed of light being constant. Look, if you're on a beltway at the airport and you're walking along the beltway at two miles an hour and the belt's going at three miles an hour with respect to the ground, you're obviously walking at five miles an hour with respect to the ground, the sum of the belt and your own speed with respect to the belt. That's Newton's law. And it didn't fit with this results about the speed of light being constant the car coming at you with its headlights on. So Kelvin gave a great talk in 1900. It was called Clouds Over 19th Century Physics, where he said the greatest unsolved problems, he basically said physics has solved all problems. There are only two outstanding small problems to worry about now. 
One is the, was called the ultraviolet catastrophe, that gave birth to quantum mechanics, and the other was the ether and in nature, and that gave birth to relativity, two of the great revolutions in physics. So there were three possible solutions. You could continue as Michelson has devoted his life to finding the ether. You could f assume that Maxwell had made a mistake and fixed Maxwell's equation. Or you could assume Newton made a mistake and fixed Newton's equations. Newton, of course, had immense authority. And it really did require tremendous boldness and confidence on the part of a 26-year-old patent attorney in Zurich, Albert Einstein, uh, to conclude that it was Newton who was wrong. So what to say about Einstein? Uh, I could summarize it by saying... Um, it slowly sunk into people that all motion is relative. Now, of course, Einstein became a great celebrity in the 20s, particularly because of work in general relativity. His paper of 1905 clarified everything at a stroke. He abolished the ether entirely. He assumed Maxwell's equations were correct. Uh, and he made changes to Newton's laws. And those changes led to the equation E equals mc squared. Now, E equals mc squared, his most famous equation, tells you the amount of energy E in a nuclear explosion when an amount of mass m is, disappears completely. And it's all a result of modifying Newton's laws so that all motion is relative and the speed of light is constant, to put it in simple terms. So this equation, of course, is of profound importance. It tells us how the stars are powered. After all, a star is just a continuous succession of hydrogen bombs. Um, and it tells us uh, nuclear energy um, and it, well, many other things, of course. Um, his theory agreed with both Bradley and, Mac and Fresnel's results. T Fresnel had got the right answer for the wrong reason. He played the violin. He was once asked if he hadn't been a physicist, what would he have done with his life? He said, oh, I'd have been a musician. In 1933, the Nazis uh, stole his sailboat. That was kind of the last straw. At that point, he moved to Princeton and stayed there till he died in 1955. But before that, he'd asked Churchill for help moving Jewish children out of Germany, uh, which Churchill did in response to Einstein's letter. And uh, my boss at Oxford, Sir Peter Hirsch, was one of those children. He said he was a deeply religious non-believer. And very poignant words for our times now, without ethical culture, there is no salvation for humanity. So I want to put in here a plug for our own research because it seems so appropriate but just by pure chance. One of the things, my main job in America is as director of science for a consortium. We got a big $50 million grant from the NSF for 10 years among seven universities, Stanford, Cornell, um, ASU, which is, which is by far the biggest of them, uh, and uh, others, Rice, um, UCSF. And we got the grant to use the X-ray laser, which was just invented in 2009, to try to make movies of molecular machines at work. These are the little molecular things going in your body all the time that uh, heal a wound, for example. Um, and this is one that uh, Professor Marius Schmidt's team led in a big collaboration in 2016. The, these are molecular uh, proteins, and they're the proteins in the material at the back of your eye, and, oh, this, it's the same protein here. It's called a cis-trans isomerization reaction. This across the top is the top view. These are frames of a movie stepping across, and this is the side view. And what we do is to flash some light, as you would uh, if light was coming into your eye, on this protein, and then a little later take an X-ray snapshot of it. And each delay, between when we flash the light on it and when we take its snapshot gives us one frame of a movie. Yeah? And then we repeat that many times. It's like a stroboscope. And we build up a movie by changing the delay. And this is the result. And what happens is that this uh, molecule along the dashed line here changes at this thick line from a left-handed conformation, left-handed shape, like your left, -handed, like your left hand, to a right-handed shape because it's absorbed a photon of light. And when it changes from left to right, it sends a signal to your brain which says you've seen a flash of light. And that's how it works. So this is the photo detector in your eye. 
But the time resolution is the extraordinary thing. The time between this frame and this frame is about a millionth of a millionth of a second. So these are in femtoseconds down the bottom here. This is, okay, so a millionth of a millionth of a second because our X-ray pulse is so brief. We can, get, we can resolve the motion of this uh, wriggling protein. And it just struck me that this is exactly relevant to something that Feynman said in 1950 when quantum electrodynamics, another branch of physics, was being established. He said that when an atom in the sun shakes, my eye electron shakes eight minutes later because of a direct interaction. OK, I'll finish up now. And uh, let me just sort of, in a more philosophical direction, speculate what, a, what is this ether thing? Of what stuff does an electric field consist? Now, the vacuum state in modern physics is thought to be alive with virtual particles and things and this vacuum energy thought to be responsible for the origin of the universe, the Big Bang. So you could say that modern QED just replaces the ether with another thing with a different name and you're just replacing one unknown with another. That would be pretty correct. Maxwell himself understood that mathematics is a metaphor in physics. He wrote, the analogy between light and vibrations of an elastic ether, although its importance and fruitfulness cannot be overestimated, we must recollect that it's based on a resemblance in form between the laws of light and the laws of vibrations. So he knew that these equations of his were metaphorical, but they worked. He didn't understand what was the underlying reality. Well, what is reality is a deep question, of course, in quantum mechanics, what is real? Stephen Hawking, Hawking spoke once of a model-dependent reality and the idea that consciousness is nothing but the sum of all this sort of anticipatory modeling that our brain is doing all the time. And it leaves you with a fundamental question, is reality out there waiting to be discovered or do we somehow impose our imagination on it to create it? That's what John von Neumann, one of the greatest mathematicians and physicists of the last century, believed. The speed of light, if we come back to that, I'm afraid to say it's no longer measured. In 1986, it was defined in terms of other const known constants, so there's no point in uh, measuring it anymore. We know we've defined its value very precisely. And it's been fundamental to many things. The GPS, I think. But more interesting, I think, is the acceptance of Darwin's theory. You know, the, the reason they had, it was so difficult to accept Darwin's ideas <clears throat> in around 1900 was simply people couldn't imagine that the Earth was as old as it is. It's about four billion years old, and life's been around for more than three billion. They couldn't comprehend such times. And only after measuring the speed of light and using it for the redshift and the expansion of the universe can we scale, the, put a time scale on the universe and on the Earth. So scaling those times really aided acceptance of Darwin's theory. And I'll end with Eugene Wigner's famous essay on the unreasonable, it's, it's, physicists love talking, giving this quote in their talks, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Uh, he wrote that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend, for better or worse, for our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement, to wider branches of learning. So that's the end. Uh, this is a picture of Cassini's, the, I'm sorry, the Paris Observatory. It's still there, that building. I went and saw it last summer. Uh, when Cassini was boss and then the time that uh, Roma was measuring the speed of light from the moons of Jupiter. Um, and I hope you don't feel that, as Mark Twain said, the professor has cast great darkness on the subject and if he continues we shall soon know nothing at all. <laughs> Down the bottom are um, some of the topics I've left out, didn't have time for, which are all covered in the book. Um, but I think that the story of the measurement of the speed of light really is one of mankind's greatest intellectual adventures. I've tried to show the challenge it created for our most fundamental ideas about the foundations of science, space, and time in the universe, and the inspiring ingenuity of the experimentalists who are part of this great adventure. And it does seem to me that the speed of light is the most important of our physical constants, appearing widely throughout science, 
and also providing a kind of unifying, playing a kind of unifying role in physics. Thank you. <laughs>